right, in this part of chapter 18, we're talking about solubility equilibrium. Now, we know about solubility. We know the solubility rules. And we know that not every ionic salt is soluble. But there is a small amount of these, what we call insoluble, traditionally insoluble salts that do dissociate. And we have a solubility product, just like we do for every other case of equilibrium we talked about in this course. And it's called the KSP. Now, the KSP is our solubility product constant. The larger the KSP, the more dissociation and the more soluble a compound is. The lower it is, the less soluble it is. And it's represented by the same way we solve for every single equilibrium. And keep in mind, this weird F is an equilibrium. So we have our uh, silver chloride, which is traditionally insoluble. If it were to be soluble, it would go into Ag plus plus Cl minus. Aqueous. Since the AgCl is a solid, we do not put it into our equilibrium value, into an equilibrium constant because it is a solid and it's not concentration bound. And then this dissociation is only governed by the formation and the concentrations of Ag plus and Cl minus. So that's KSP. And we can solve that just like we can, or we can use that just like we can for every other equilibrium possibility, like that we went over in class. Yes, you don't like the letter K anymore. Yep, it's, there's too many Ks. All right, so here's an example of some, what we call traditionally insoluble salts from Chem 1, what their KSP is. Some of them are very small, some of them are very large. Larger ones, kind of like KAs and KBs, you'll see tend to negative third, fourth, and fifth. But then when you have very insoluble compounds like copper 2 sulfide, you have 10 to the negative 30, 36, and even 10 to the negative 11, 17, and 19. It's a very insoluble. So you'll have an extremely small percentage of soluble product when you try to dissolve these substances. And here's some more. We'll see these charts later on. We can then, we can then figure out the, well, let's go over what is solubility first. We have solubility is the amount of solute that dissolves in a given amount of solution volume, right? And solubility is usually measured in grams per milliliter, grams per liter, generally, then you can have um, even moles per liter. Now, moles per liter, that looks, that looks familiar, right? That's molarity. That's what the molar solubility is. Molar solubility is kind of like a standard of how you determine solubility. It's the number of moles that can dissolve in one liter of solution. So if the molar solubility of NaCl is five, that means the maximum number of moles that you can put of NaCl into one liter of water is five with it fully dissolving. If you put more than five, you'll have whatever that excess is, it won't dissolve. So that's the molar solubility. And molar solubility is directly related to KSP because KSP determines how much of it can dissolve. It's the concentration ratios. But it's, I mean, there's, there is a difference though. So KSP, is determined by, um, well, it's just determined by experimentation. But relative solubility and molar solubility is also determined by um, experimentation, but it varies because there are multi ionic substances. So we cannot say the, the molar solubility of, let's say, Na2, well, if it's Na, it's always soluble, Ca3. SO4 or PO42, the solubility of this will have a it will have a higher molar solubility because the molarity of calciums or molarity of ions will be different. So then you'll have, and since you're multiplying in the KSP, you're multiplying the concentrations of calcium by the concentration of phosphate. It would be concentration of calcium cubed times the concentration of phosphate squared. This, this product is going to be a lot different and usually either a lot bigger or a lot smaller than its corresponding relative solubility, its molar solubility. So, um, but they, in essence, they do the same thing. 
Now let's talk about the common ion effect. Now we did mention this definition in the beginning of this chapter a long time ago, but now we're gonna cover it in a little more detail. And all it's saying is that if you have, and read this first, I don't like reading from slides, but let's say this first statement's very good and I'll walk you through it. The addition of a soluble salt that contains one of the ions of the insoluble salt decreases the solubility of the insoluble salt. So what that means is that if you add a soluble salt to a solution that already has an insoluble salt, let's say CaF2 dissolves into Ca2 plus and F2 minus. And then we add a soluble salt that has a common ion to one of these two things, the calcium and the fluoride. Let's say we add NaF. NaF, when it breaks apart, it's a soluble ion. It goes into Na plus and F minus. What you are essentially doing is you are adding more F minus to this solution. And based on our La Chateaire's principle, what is going to happen when you add more of that product? It's going to shift to the left, making less of the soluble products form from this calcium fluoride, meaning there will be less dissociation and the solubility will decrease. So that's the, that's the common ion effect in a nutshell. Any questions on that? So it's, it's, it's to kind of, it throws off the equilibrium if you have another ionic substance with a similar ion. Good, I like that you like to shift here. It's an easy, it's one of the easier principles that keeps coming up. Okay, so now question, in which solution is barium sulfate most soluble? And keep in mind, barium sulfate is one of these weakly soluble things. So it will go into Ba2 plus plus SO4 minus. So which one of these is it the most soluble in? Ding, 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 we have an answer. C, and C is the correct answer. Good job, Sebastian. And the reason why it's C is because C has no common ions with barium or sulfate. If we put in barium nitrate, which is a strong electrolyte and will completely dissociate, what will happen is the barium concentration increases. Therefore, the equilibrium will shift to the left. Same thing with sodium sulfate. It's strongly, it's a strong electrolyte again. Sulfate will increase, making the equilibrium go to the left. NaNO3 does not have any common ions with barium or sulfate, so it won't affect the equilibrium in any way, and it'll be equally as soluble in sodium nitrate as it would be by itself. Okay, moving on. So the effect of pH on solubility. So before we start, I'll put these Fs, make them into equilibriums. All right. Now, these are the book does a really good job here of explaining this. So I'll just I'll just read it and we'll talk about it. For insoluble ionic hydroxides. Oh, question. Yes. So insoluble ionic hydroxides. What does that mean? That means like magnesium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, iron hydroxide. These are insoluble, for the most part, ionic hydroxides. But they're bases, right? Because they have hydroxide. The lower, or the higher the pH, the lower the solubility. Think about that. Hmm, what does that mean? High pH means you have a lot of OHs. That makes perfect sense that it'll lower the solubility, right? Based on what we just learned. Let's look at this. The same thing as common ion effect. Let's look at magnesium hydroxide dissociation. If you're adding more OHs into this, let's say you're adding, um, sorry, you put in magnesium hydroxide into a already basic solution, meaning high pH. What's going to happen? The higher amount of OHs present are, is going to shift this equilibrium more towards the left, making the solubility of the ionic hydroxide decrease. Vice versa, if you have a lower pH, meaning 
not a lot of hydroxides and more hydrogens, the dissociation rate is going to be increased of our insoluble ionic hydroxide because this hydroxide is going to want to rip off the magnesium and quench some of the hydrogens that are present. It's going to attempt to neutralize the acid. So that's in lower pH environments, these ionic hydroxides have a higher solubility because they're in an effort to strip or in an effort to, um, well, yeah, strip the H3O pluses of their additional hydrogen and create water to neutralize them. All right, does that make sense? Or, or, or are there any questions on that concept? Same exact thing, but just with acids and bases. Very conceptual. Okay, now let's talk about the other case. For insoluble ionic compounds that contain anions of weak acids. Now, all right, hold up. That's a lot of words. Here's an example. Calcium carbonate. It has an anion that does not form hickel hipper high hanoa cloaso. This is why it's very important to know if something has an anion of a strong base or a strong acid or whatever, because here it comes into play. Carbonate creates carbonic acid, weak acid. And this is an insoluble salt. So insoluble salt that has a cation of a weak acid. It will dissociate into calcium and carbonate. If you have a lower pH, meaning more hydrogens, the higher the solubility. Why is that? Because carbonate loves to be hydrogenated or it loves to be protonated because carbonic acid and even hydrogen carbonate are very stable ions or very stable compounds. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. That means it does not like to dissociate with its, with its hydrogen. It doesn't like to be deprotonated. Therefore, when you add it to a low pH environment, it's going to want to dissociate more readily to, in order to interact and quench and take in those um, hydrogen molecules. In essence, calcium carbonate will act as a base. And that is exactly what it's used for. So calcium carbonate is one of the most common antacids. Same thing for magnesium hydroxide. It's, an ant it's a common um, active ingredient in antacids because it acts as a weak base by this exact mechanism. Okay, moving on. Precipitation. We know what precipitation is. We know precipitation reactions. And they will occur, precipitation, when there is an excess amount of the ions that are beyond the solubility limit, beyond the molar solubility. And we can quantify this by our reaction quotient very easily. So remember the reaction quotient. What it was, was the same thing as the equilibrium constant, but not at equilibrium. So this is where it comes into play again, where you can determine if the solution is saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated from, this, from the comparison of Q and KSP. So KSP, remember, it's the molar solubility constant. It is the threshold. If Q, which is the reaction quotient, equals, in terms of concentrations, the same exact thing. It is the same exact, same exact thing as KSP, but at a different point, not at the equilibrium time. If Q equals KSP, that means the amount of products that are dissociated from this insoluble ionic salt are exactly the concentrations they need to be. No more, no less. If you add more, it will be, it won't dissolve. If you add, if you take away some, you can add more, whatever. If Q is less than KSP, that means more can be added and it will still dissolve. So the solution is unsaturated and there's no precipitation. If Q is greater than KSP, you have a higher concentration than the molar solubility meaning the solution would be above its saturation point and you will see precipitate. 
meaning a cloudy substance and you might be different colors, but it's gonna be solid. Some solutions we have super saturated where you really can't tell, but it depends on the solution that if Q is greater than KSP, but it doesn't precipitate unless you shake it around or you add something else to it, unless it's disturbed. Um, and this is, this is possible too, and we call it um, seeding. Sometimes you have a super, and this happens often in like uh, chem one, chem two kind of bench top chemistry where you do reactions and you end up with a super saturated solution that it, it, it's above the KSP, but nothing's happening. But then if you add a common ion or if you shake it around or add water or add something, it seeds the solution with another ion that is insoluble or by, forms an insoluble salt, which, which, uh, word, which um, facilitates, better word, facilitates the rest of the product to form or the rest of the precipitate to form. But that's not too, too important. And here's examples of particip per participation. Wow. Um, participation is what you're going to do after this, but precipitation. And here's a simple precipitation reaction. Here's some other ones too. So here, a supersaturated solution right here of sodium acetate will precipitate if a seed crystal is added. So you can, a seed crystal, don't, don't, that sounds like a, a mythical object, like he, he has a seed crystal. No, but all it means is a crystal of acetic acid. And if you add that, or acetate, acetate salt, that would just seed the rest of the solution to make it, it'd be, it's really cool actually. Okay, then there's this whole thing of selective precipitation. And yes, those pictures are very cool. Selective precipitation. This means if you have a solution that contains different cations, a lot of different ones. We can selectively pick which one we want to precipitate based on their KSPs, as long as they're very different. Now, can anyone think of an example in our everyday lives where you have solutions or mixtures that have a multiple types of ions or cations in there? Sodium, potassium, iron, zinc, uh, even other ions too, chlorines, fluorines, selenium, things like, like, so what, what can you think of? Gatorade, that's true, but I'm thinking more of, um, can you think of when selective precipitation might be useful for our health? Blood, okay, there are, there are these things in our blood. Clotting, eh, not clotting, but blood, there, is, there are these ions in our blood. But think simple, what do we need every day to live? I mean, we do need blood, but like, what else do we need? Water, boom, awesome. So water, in our water supply, there is on, on water and um, water plants that purify, purification systems. They do a lot of this to test water levels, selective precipitation. That's why you ever gotten a call or email or notice in the mail that there's too much lead in your water. The way they figure that out is by taking a sample of it and well, the way they used to do it is by selective precipitation. This, these are very basic experiments. Now you just put a probe in there and it detects lead levels, very easy. But back in the day, they used to do it this way. Yep, hashtag NJ. I was up in, um, Waldwick, where my girlfriend lives, and they got notice in the mail saying that they had, uh, what was it called? It was called parafluorooctane sulfonic acid in the water. And that's a weak, very weak acid. The PKA is like 10 to negative 20th or something. But um, yep, that's, uh, that's crazy. But there's all kinds of stuff. Around. And I live in Jersey City, so probably lead and other stuff in that, in that water too. Um, okay, so let's do an example. And I'll walk you through this one. Um, so a solution contains equal concentrations of barium, lead, and calcium. When potassium sulfate is added to the solution, which cation precipitates first? So think about it. You're adding potassium sulfate, keyword is sulfate. You're adding a sulfate. And remember, if you add a common ion to some of these weakly soluble compounds, it will form the precipitate. 
So if you think about it, which one will form a precipitate faster? So I will highlight the things that are important. If you look on the chart, maybe you can't see it. You have barium sulfate, very important. Lead sulfate. And calcium sulfate. So any ideas? Um, barium sulfate, the KSP is 10 to negative 10. Calcium, 10 to negative 5. And lead, 10 to negative 8. So which one of those you think, when you add more sulfate, potassium sulfate, whatever, will precipitate first? And why? Any ideas? Will it be the one with the lower KSP or the higher KSP that will precipitate first? Think about the, the equilibrium, right? You're adding, remember the Chetier's principle, you're adding more to the right side of the dissociation. Which one's gonna go left the fastest or first? Okay, so Sebastian, good shot, good try, but unfortunately, calcium's not it. It's the opposite. Yeah, it's A. So thank you, Naomi. Good job. But good job, both of you. Thank you for participating. Very important. Uh, also, another thing is, if you want to cheat the system a little bit with, with me or with any professor, especially online or even without online, if you keep participating either in the chat or by talking, I will keep seeing your name. If I keep seeing your name, that's a good thing. So there's select maybe 10 to 15 of you that I keep seeing your name. Very good. I'm not saying everybody else is bad. I'm just saying when it comes time to grading things and, and giving final grades, this goes, this is on, no professor is completely unbiased. If you have, I'm not saying I'm gonna change your grades. I'm just saying that every professor, and you don't play favorites either, but every professor, if you see students that are um, more enthusiastic about the subject, um, highly participating, you're more likely to give them better grades if they're on the cusp of maybe an A and a B. That's, that's exactly, that's exactly, it. I mean, it's not really a trick, but it's a, it's a good thing to do. And a lot of professors um, operate that way. Every professor I've had operates that. I mean, I'm not saying to kiss ass. I'm just saying that um, showing that you're actively involved in the class and I keep seeing your name, that's very good because I just associate that and I see a grade and then I, later on, you never know. You never know. I'm just saying it's important to a little extent. It doesn't hurt. I'll put that. Okay. So um, the answer is, I think Naomi had it right, that the lower KSP gives you the precipitation first. And the reason why is because it has, the KSP, at, if it's very low, that means the barium concentration when it, and also the sulfate concentration, when it disso dissociates is going to be, well, barium itself is going to be very low. If you're adding the sulfate, that means it really doesn't want to be sulfate alone and barium alone. That means if it's 10 to negative 10, that means a very small amount of sulfate by itself and barium by itself is gonna exist. It wants to exist as barium sulfate in a solid form, more than calcium sulfate and lead sulfate. So that's why that is. The lower KSP, meaning it does not wanna be a solid, or doesn't, sorry, does not wanna be broken apart. They like to be together. Just like for acids, where if you have a weak acid, that means or like 10 to negative 10 Ka, that means it wants to be in its HA, meaning acid form, a lot more than its conjugate. And yes, Christina, a great way to get your name seen is to be on the subscriber list. Well, I don't check, that's not true. I don't check that too much. I mean, I do, but it, it will never influence a grade at all. Like don't, I'm, that's, I'm not allowed to do that and I'm not saying that at all. So um, you said it, not me. Um, and uh, any questions about this answer now that I, kind of explained it. No, I know you were joking. I just have to say that because like, 
just to clear the air, just in case anybody thinks the wrong thing, I just have to say that. So KSP is equivalent to percent association. It's not percent association, it's, it's um, proportional to it. So a lower KSP, same thing as a lower KA. That means you're gonna have low dissociation and it much more prefers to be in its non-dissociated form. Okay, good. All right, so um, the, the last part isn't super, super critical, um, but because it's nothing you need to really memorize here, but the selective particip participation, yeah, precipitation, it works in a way where you have what we call quantitative analysis schemes, where these schemes can be used to selectively precipitate several ions one at a time. So let's say you have three ions, A, B, and C. You use an agent one to get rid of A, agent, and then you uh, decant it, meaning you put it through a filter, and then you collect A, or you collect the, pr the precipitate of A. Then you do it again with another precipitation agent, collect B, and then you do the same thing for C even, or for A, and collect it. But you can keep doing this over and over again. And here's how the scheme works. Now, I'm not gonna go over this in crazy detail and you're not gonna need to know it for exams in, crazy, in any detail really, but um, I'm just letting you know that this is a thing. And I mean, this is using the selective precipitation on a, on a bigger scale. And there are different groups of ions that you would test for first. And there's different ways to test for different groups of ions based on their solubility. So the first ones are silver, lead, and mercury. Those should ring a bell to you. Silver, lead, and mercury are the ions that I would always say, and in my, if you've ever seen my videos, that they are most frequently found to be insoluble. The chlorides are insoluble. The sulfates are insoluble. The phosphates are insoluble. The carbonates are insoluble, and more. But one way to get rid of these first is you can add HCl. The chlorides are insoluble, and it would strip these out. And again, not too, not too critical to memorize any of this, but just letting you know, group two, you have another set of ions. Um, you have copper, bismuth, and then you can add um, hydrosulfuric acid and it'll precipitate them out. Group three, you have zinc, iron, and you can add NaOH because their hydroxides are these insoluble ionic hydroxides, the ones we talked about before, that if you, that they're more insoluble at a um, at a higher pH, right? Because you have more OH in there. Then group four, magnesium, calcium, and barium, they could be extracted with phosphate or hydrogen phosphate. And yes, we do need an acronym or a song for the solubility rules. I do like that. You know what? Here's an extra credit. I'm gonna throw it out there right now. I will give you extra credit if you come up with a good catchy song slash acronym whatever for the solubility rules doesn't have to be perfect but if you come up with one and email it to me oh there's a good one on youtube damn it all right i take that back well you know what? give me one that's different than the youtube one if you want to call if you have spare time maybe like i know i've been doing this lately where i just sit there at like 12 midnight to two o'clock and just ponder my existence and like do nothing. If you're at that state, you can think of a good song uh, to, about solubility rules. So yeah, everybody, everybody does that now. I think it's a COVID thing. Well, I used to do it a little bit before, but now it's every night I'm just like sitting there and just like wondering like, what am I doing? And yeah, their best ideas come between 12 and three. It's a co it has to be a COVID thing because we're all like messed up. All right, but anyway, um, let me finish up. So group five, you have another set of ions. Then we talk about complex ions. Now real quick, they follow the same rules as every other type of ion, but complex ions are a thing where you have the addition of water to an ion makes a hydrate, makes a, to a cation can make a hydrate form. So there's different types of, maybe you've seen this in Gen Chem one or two lab where there's hydrated complexes. And we call these sometimes ligands. Um, well, the ligands are what's added to the complex ion, but you can have complex ions that have hydrates in them, or just a combination of different types of ions. So like um, 
silver, ammonia, and ammonia put together make a complex ion. But they follow the same rules as, as all this other stuff, as equilibria. Um, and they have their own formation constant, which is called Kf. So you can see how as I'm breezing over this, it's not critical, like super critical. There may not be a question on it on the exam. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, but they follow the same general rules as we talk about for Ksp. They have their own values, their Kfs. And the effective complex ion formation on solubility. Well, if you have a, this is a good, this is a good statement. So the solubility of an ionic compound that contains a metal cation that forms a complex ion increases in the presence of aqueous ligands. All right, let's break that down. The solubility of an ionic compound that contains a metal that forms a complex ion. All right, so silver, chloride. Silver forms a complex ion. And how do you know if something forms a complex ion? Really, a lot of the transition metals form complex ions. Really, all of them do. I would say that's kind of like a pseudo rule of thumb that most transition metals can form complex ions, but you don't need to memorize those complex ions at all. So if you have an, an ionic compound that contains one of these metals, the transition metals that would form these complex ions, the solubility is increased when you have the ligand, with the ligand, is what binds or what sticks to that uh, transition metal in order to form the complex ion product. So it's kind of facilitating because what we know is that the silver and all of these ions, they want to form these complex ions. They're pretty favorable. So because of that, if you have those those uh, ligands, the, the things that the kind of the, uh, we'll call them the pseudo anions that stick to the metal to form the complex ion. When you have them in solution, it's going to kind of strip away or help strip away the silver or the metal from its insoluble salt. 